Welcome to Strip Cover Lit, where we squeeze the bigger picture out of literature, and we are promising a video every day in 2019. I'm Adrian Fort. And I'm Dalton Gentry. And we are here for part two of a five-part series, which I may have accidentally introduced as a four-part series, getting my hopes up last time, as we journey through... Again, but better, by Christine Riccio, better known as Poland Banana Books. What happened this time, Dalton? This is pages 91 through 184 of this text, the first half of the novel, right at the split where we change years. Uh, let me, I got two breakdowns. Let me give you the first one here. Shane, Pilot, Babe, and Chad go to Paris, and Shane and Pilot grow closer. For never having kissed a boy before, she suddenly starts to kiss a lot of them. There's drama. Pilot and Shane grow distant, and his girlfriend Amy comes to visit. So, Shane's parents come to visit. There's not a so there, I just squiggled, my bad. Shane's parents also come to visit. And Sarah lets slip that she's not pre-med. More drama, Shane goes home to the US. It's basically what happened. In reality, rich spoiled woman spends daddy's money. Daddy finds out she's a liar and was using him. Girlfriend of boy she's pursuing reads her diary. Rich spoiled woman cries a lot because no one likes her basically what we're looking at here. Yeah, um, it's sort of the classic literary, what's this poem about and what's this poem about, right? Yeah. It's about a rose, but it's about love. This is about uh, a young writer finding her way, but it's also about entitlement. This is brutal. This was awful. Yeah, this was the, this broke me a little bit as a reader. Um, yeah. So I'd like to, I'll tell you where I'd like to start. Where would you like to start? I would like to start on 103. I take more notes in this book than I do anything else that we read, so but please. But they're all just Shatner. Uh, and this is, this is where it started to unravel for me. They're out with Chad. Chad nods his head past us, Chad nods his head past us at something. Check her out, man, he says in his bro voice. And it was the framing that got me. Chad is a bro. Mm. How pop culture. But Pilot is a pin, which is what Shane is in love with, writing. And Babe is Babe because she's Babe. She's a Babe. Babe. And Atticus is a name that still has no meaning. Absolutely none whatsoever. The one, the one name in here. The one literary is, reference. That is literally begging you, begging of you to read into it. Nothing. Nothing. Well, so far, now, now there's still half the novel left. To be fair, the author may not know what Atticus is from because every literary reference we get is either the Mortal Instruments, Dan Brown, or Harry Potter. Dalton, you should not be speaking down on that. Before we started Just the say. channel, those were all your literary references, too. Just say. Um, also, why are we speaking so bad about Chad when Pilot is the weaseliest example of a hipster I've ever read in print? Um, and I don't want this to just be bashing. I really don't. Uh, like, like we started off last video, this type of thing has the right to exist. It does. And you give credit where credit is due. But when something is bad, and something's not clicking, and it's not working, it needs to be addressed. Right, so I, I mentioned entitlement. Yes. And Chad is the element upon which that entitlement switched for me, and just slapped me in the face. Okay. Babe, so w with that little moment we read there, Shane is furious because she thinks Chad is observing the attractiveness of another woman. Okay. Right? When she believes Chad belongs to Babe. However, we get an argument between the two that Chad has never agreed to that. Never once. And is being essentially preyed upon here. Chad is under the assumption that he and Babe are friends. Okay. Men and women can be friends. Absolutely. Men and women can architect one another's birthdays. It seems to him that's what's going on here. Instead, he's supposed to belong to Babe because Babe has declared it so. Babe is entitled to Chad. So it be done. Uh, 
there's a lot of stuff going on here that's driving me nuts. It's not just the entitlement. Uh, what it keeps coming back to, and I, I just keep having to like remind myself that I'm not reading this incorrectly, the main character here, Shane, is a 20-year-old woman. She is 20 years old. That's she an is adult. an adult. 20 years old. I've known people who were burnt out by 20. <laughs> this character acts, reacts, like a five-year-old. The big, big turning point here is out of nowhere, mom and dad come to England to visit because that's what you do when you have unlimited money. Because money is not a question to any of these characters, we've established that. Mom and dad show up and Sarah, who is at no fault whatsoever, she's being pinned as the bad guy for doing this, but she didn't know. She has no fault here. Says, no, she's not pre-med. I don't work with her. I don't know what you're talking about. In fairness, she's, I think Sarah says, I'm not pre-med. Yeah. But they were not, talking about working right, together. Right, right. So, uh, which, by the way, if you're not a professional liar, never implicate someone else in your lie. True. Never do that. Bad news. Um, she had no reason to say that she worked with Sarah. Yeah, Sarah did nothing wrong here. <clears throat> she just made it up. So um, Shane gets caught red-handed, and it comes, you know, out into the light here that basically she's lying to her parents. She's used her father's trust to take all his money and go on this grand adventure because she just wanted to. Calm down, not all. Okay, Excuse Obviously, me. we're loaded. Obviously. But she spent a good portion of dad's money. And she's made all these promises to her parents. A good deal of dad's money. Excuse me. She's made all these promises to her parents. She's playing with her parents' emotions. This is something that her mother is very near and dear to. This is something that her father's wanting. You know, want <clears throat> you to have a good life, want what's best for you. And instead of just addressing this and saying, you know, this isn't for me, this is what I want to do, I want to cut my own path, why not just lie to them? Because you know what? They're going to give me the money I want if I tell them everything's fine. If I bat my eyes and say, hey, Dad, I'm going to be pre-med. Can I have all this money to do this? Absolutely. This is what you're trying to do. We support that. But that's not what she's doing. She's lying to her parents. And when it comes out that she is lying, Dad cuts her off. He is a gentleman enough to say, you know what? Finish out the semester. You do you, kid. You're done when you get home. Going back to work? But I'm, I'm going to be your boss. Yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll still give you the money. I do love the point at one point she mentioned, you know, she's been saving all this money from all the jobs she's been working this summer. And then like 20 pages later, well, she works for her dad. Right. So still, dad's money. But anyway, a 20-year-old woman. You can make your own decisions. Fun fact, get a job. Pay for things yourself. Take out a student loan. I know a lot of people who did that. I was one of them. When I travel abroad, I had to take out a student loan. I'm still paying that off. But instead, lie to your parents. And when they cut you off, act like a child about it. Cry for days. Send them emails. There's one quote in here where she's like, well, I sent them three emails. I just don't know why they're still mad at me. It's because you're a liar. So here's the problem. You're running very fast on a slippery, slippery slope. Lay it on me. I'm a little emotional with this one. Um, you don't like Shane. I don't. Which is okay. It's fair. You cannot like a protagonist and still have a good time with the read. Um, Lolita. Okay, no, here, I'll, I'll, I'll make this first. This is what makes this more than evident. On page 122, um, we have her coming out about her lie to Pilot, Pilot Pin. Mm -hmm. They wouldn't pay for college if I didn't major in something that lined me up for a lucrative future. I blink at the ceiling. My grandpa did the struggling artist thing, wrote poetry and stuff, worked for a bunch, worked a bunch of temporary jobs. It made him a pretty shitty dad. He was never around, and when he was, he was distant and tired and had sort of a short fuse with my dad and his siblings. So what we're doing there is we're setting up this dichotomy between me and the grandpa because I'm better than him, which, fair enough. You want to make that claim, make that claim. But we're skirting on, we're skirting around the statement that we deserve that. The sense of entitlement there. I deserve this. I agree. Um, for the next sentence, for now, my dad's obsessed with financial stability in his macho Italian, I'm a real man sort of way. So now, 
not only, not only are we using the fact that, I mean, you know, I, I'm so good, obviously I deserve this. Yes. But we're switching and saying, and you're just against it because of your gender. You're a macho man and an Italian guy, right? So you just don't understand. Now, this is all fine to do in literature. It is fine to put that example out there. What's not fine is at the same time to still be expecting your reader's sympathy. Okay. So, um, and because this is where I stand to take criticism because I really like American Psycho. Okay. Despicable main character. True story. I really, really love, in a painful way, Lolita. Most despicable protagonist I've ever read. Gorgeous novel. Patrick Bateman in American Psycho tells you to hate him. Fair. Dares you to hate him. And you cannot look away. The precision and skill with which that novel is written to exploit the environment in which Patrick Bateman thrives is flawless. In Lolita, Humbert is literally begging you to love him from page one. From page one, he's begging you to love him. Um, let me get here. I should have had this lined up. Uh, did she have a precursor? She did. Indeed, she did. In point of fact, there may have been no Lolita at all had I not loved one summer a certain initial girl child. It's not my fault. When I was a child, I loved this child. In Princeton by the sea, oh when? About as many years before Lolita was born as my age was that summer. Again, don't blame me. Blame the ages. You can always count on a murderer for a fancy prose style. He's telling you, he's telling you right up front. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, exhibit number one is what the seraphs, the misinformed, simple, noble-winged seraphs envied. Look at this tangle of thorns. Blame not me, but the thorns. That is gorgeous. Yes, it is. That is skillful. That is craft. That is what draws you in and begs you begs you to love him. We never get that from this character. No. What we get from this character, if, if just to finish, um, Shane is just. Shane just is. Naked in all her expectation. Okay. There is no attempt to persuade the reader here. Shane is naked on the page because the expectation is that the reader will sympathize with her because you're supposed to. She's the protagonist. Accept her because she's the protagonist. Be one with her entitlement because this is first person, baby. That is where the expectation is here. Okay. There is no artistry on display because I don't, th and, and look, this is a first novel, right? I'm not, I'm not judging someone. Sometimes it takes time. You gotta iron out the kinks. And, and those are very hard things to pull off. I mean, there's only one Lolita for a reason. Not everybody can write this. Fair. This is once every other generation, not even a generational talent. Um, but what happens when you don't, when you don't collaborate or corroborate with your own protagonist in the prose you're putting on the paper, is that protagonist is just judged on face value. This is a garbage person. Yeah. Shane is a garbage person. I would argue most of the characters in here are garbage people. Well, a uh, few exceptions. It, the one exception, ironically, to me, seems to be Chad. Chad tried something slimy and to, to kiss Shane. Um, Shane did that to someone else. Right? It was okay when she did it. It, it. Completely fine when she did it. I would argue Sarah is at no fault. She seemed to be not really mentioned too often. She's not around often, but the, she's being billed as the bad guy because she let the cat out of the bag, but really, she didn't know what was going on. She's being honest. 
And Atticus. Atticus seems to be a, a pretty decent guy. He's working hard at his studies. He's there for Shane when you know he thinks he needs to be, when she needs someone. Beyond that, we never hear from him again. But I will agree with you on 123, right about that area, 122, 123, which you're just talking about. I even noted this could have been a real moment here. We could have had our first touching moment, our first real moment. I know exactly where you're going. If she realized at this point what was going on, if she opened up to Pilot and we had that change in character, if there was growth here, but she doesn't. She does. Pilot's at fault here. You think so? Um, I can do it. I'm good at it. I can do it. I know I'm going to do it. I swallow hard. Pilot's watching me intent attentively. Yada, 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 yada. Um, I, they would find out, and I don't, I don't know. Sure. I haven't told anyone. I haven't told anyone any of this. Pilot's fingers weave through mine. He squeezes my hand. Warmth shoots up through my fingertips. It's quiet for a minute before Pilot says, Shane. That's insanely badass. Mm -hmm. um, absolutely, spoken like a true hipster. Badass means lying to your parents so you have access to their money and you don't have to go at it on your own. Mm -hmm. That is exactly what a hipster would say. It's gorgeous, isn't it? Yeah. And wonderful, isn't it? Wearing a plaid shirt and having an ironic beard and stupid glasses. We're good here. I would like to bring something up though. Kind of just oh, change yeah. just, just, just Please finish though. Not I think to, you're not on a hot to, streak. So, on the, on the uh, paragraph which finishes 122 and leads into 123, there's, leading back to entitlement, she says this, um, I started looking into programs, saw this writing internship track in London, and I knew it was my chance to try to do, to try to do what I would really love to do, because there's the internship, a writing internship, like a real job. And if I did well there, maybe they could help me get a paid internship. Maybe they could help me get an internship. It's not my maybe job. Maybe they could help. They Please give could this help. To me. Someone could give me something else. I would also like to point out, this is not a stretching of the truth. This is not something that just got out of hand. This is intentional. This is premeditated. Which she even went as far to make a brochure for a fake program to lie to her parents knowingly. Which again, that's all fine. But A, your, your character has to feel remorse so that your reader, especially in YA, can learn from that. Or B, your character has to completely own it and illustrate that, no, your character is a bad guy, right? This character does none of that. There's gotta be growth. But there is none whatsoever. The character is just really upset because she's not getting her way. She's throwing a tantrum. Yeah. That is what this is. Which, uh, um, I think this concludes my argument on the entitlement deal. Um, da, 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 da. 126 through 127. Babe snorts. Uh, this is after the date has gone wrong with Chad. Uh, the, yeah. Babe snorts and meets my eyes. Her... Hers are glassy. Last night at the bar, I thought things were going really well. He freaked out. And later when we got back to the room, I wanted to explain, but he wasn't having it. He just talked over me. Babe, we've talked about this. I like short girls. You're not my type. God, why are you trying to ruin this? We're having fun and you're trying to ruin things. It's so frustrating. Her chat impression is pitchy, but I like it. She continues, and I was like, I don't understand why you don't ask me to play, play in your birthday. Why you asked me to play in your birthday then? And he had the nerve to say, I didn't ask you to play in anything. And I was like, you sure as hell didn't ask me not to. Here we go in Paris together for your birthday. And he goes, don't try to turn this into some romantic thing. And then I said to him being, and then I told him he was being an asshole and he stormed out of the room. Because I was, this is an attempt at coercion, right? This is, if, if they sleep together, that's rape. This is coercion. Uh, what kind of douche kebab says those things to their friend who treats anyone like that? Uh, he doesn't deserve you in his life. He eventually came back and went to sleep and apologized. No, we didn't speak this morning. What the heck? And that's why he had a hissy fit outside and didn't want to share a cab. Um, a, why should he apologize that you tried to commandeer him? B, of course he didn't want to share a cab with someone who was trying to own him. This is a man this saying, I, I don't want a relationship with you. I'm happy being a friend. Thank you for doing this birthday thing for me. 
I didn't want you to. I didn't ask you to, but you did. Don't turn this into a romantic yeah. thing. I don't want this. And she's pissed because she wants it. Yeah. And it's what she wants. So she deserves it. She deserves it. She's Everyone deserves what they it. want. She's entitled to it. Now, I'm going to switch gears here because we are running out of time. And that this is uh, one of the beautiful things about talking about this with someone else is every now and then something comes up and I'm like, something's not right here. Something's not fitting. Did I miss something? Who is this woman, this English woman she keeps running into? What, what are we looking at here? If it turns out in the end this is all for naught and this is the nurse bringing her her hallucinogenic meds and the mental ward, okay. The book's okay. But for some reason we keep running into an English woman. We saw her on the plane. Do you we want to know who it is? Do you want to know who it is? Who is it? It's Molly Weasley. Is it Molly Weasley? It's Molly Weasley. Is it? Is it a wizard in the muggle world? Yeah. It's uncomfortable. And I swear to Christ, if it does not come to fruition at all, if it's just there because, I'm going to lose myself with this. It's just there because. Don't, don't get your hopes up. Mm. Um, <laughs> on page 102, this is her talking... Uh, I don't remember what about, but she says, like, they don't ask for the lessons. I kind of obnoxiously teach them. And Oh, yeah, when, when she's talking about pictures. Like, they don't ask for lessons. I kind of obnoxiously teach them after they take pictures for me and it's framed poorly. Like, I give them a mini lecture and make them do it again. Mansplaining. 131, I obediently man my station. Sexist. 132, the cute young male employee, I noticed, sexist. 132, oldest, the oldest man in here, George, he's got pasty skin, round black rim glasses, and a receding hairline, sexist. All of her, all of her observations about men go to how attractive or unattractive they are immediately. Absolutely. Which, again, is fine if you don't think you're writing the good guy. I, I, Remember in American Psycho when he when they were referring to all the young women as hard bodies mm -hmm. and how immediately sexist that felt. Because it was supposed to. Because it was supposed to, and because it was. They weren't good people. But it was also propping up the sexist language with something blatantly sexist, right? Hard bodies, they're hard bodies. This, the cute young male employee, that's basically the same thing. It's an immediate value judgment based on attractiveness. Um, he had a receding hairline is the same thing on the opposite, the obverse side of the coin. It's an immediate judgment based on attractiveness. And we get that all the time. Now we were, but Chad is not allowed to like short women. No, that's just absolutely unacceptable. We were called out in the comments. I, I do have to bring this up about how, uh, it's not fair to be switching genders. It's not fair to make that argument that if we switch genders that it wouldn't work like this. That is actually a part of literary theory. It's a part of literary criticism and analysis. I believe it's gender theory to be specific. Yeah. That if you were to switch the uh, the gender of the character. Would it change the would text it change and the how? Text and how. All right, so it, that is a legitimate thing. We're not just poking fun at this. This is a way to analyze this text. And it is blatantly apparent, apparent that might be the proper way to analyze this text. Uh, 171, this is what I was talking about. My apologies aren't working. They're still upset. How long will they be upset? What else can I do? This is the temper tantrum. Yeah. <laughs> what else can I do? I stole all their money and they're mad at me? I spent $50,000, but you've got to understand, I sent you four emails. I sent you four emails saying I was sorry. This is ridiculous to me. This is absolutely cringeworthy. Which again, that it's fine to have that. It's fine if there's going to be a payout. You, but you're you're still expecting sympathy. It seems you're still expecting sympathy of your reader. But where are we going to go with this? Where are we going to go? We're back into the United States, so obviously we're going to have to confront the parents. I bet things are going to work out in the end. I bet nothing will be her fault, and she's just going to feel so much better and grow up to be a great writer. If ever for a moment you doubt that, take comfort, Dalton. Just take saying, solace. Just saying. And here's my thing. Maybe I'm wrong with this. Maybe I am. Maybe the turn in this novel is going to be excellent, this character is going to grow, and it's going to be decent. I'm willing to go there. Albeit, let's see it, I'm excited for it. However, if we were not reviewing this, I would not be finishing this book, because it's bad. One thing which I will pres 
You will not. You will not what? No, if we were not reviewing this, oh, I would not be finishing yeah, no, this. I'd, I'd be because dead. at this point, no, there's no point. This is awful. Uh, you have to give the reader something to be leading into. Yeah. I, one thing which I will present without comment. She's naturally pretty in a way that makes me feel insecure about the fact that I, I, I feel the need to wear makeup. I'm just gonna float that one out there. Just let that one rest in the air. Um, yeah. Let it breathe. It, it reminds me of something, but I can't place it. Craziest thing. I can't remember. Like I feel like I was. I got it written in my notes, but I, I don't know where I was going with it. That's fair. That's uh, Shane, the character, however, in other news, this is. <laughs> So this isn't her horcrux, because there's a reason to have parts of chapters in journal when you're already writing in first person. There's sure. a reason to do that. Why not? We never get there. In other news, this all-consuming crush for Pilot Pin has come to the crux. I think I need to tell him because this unrequited thing isn't working for me. I hate missing him all the time. I miss him, and I feel like an idiot. He's so obviously been avoiding me. He materializes in passing from time to time. And it's like catching the sight of a ghost or finding yourself in reach of a butterfly. I step towards him, and he floats out of reach again. He's on the way to class, going to meet with the guys down the hall, just headed out. This is stalker-level material. Fun fact, people don't have to like you, nor do people have to make time for you. Well, I'm sorry it's a sad reality of the world, but maybe the uh, character here hasn't experienced that just yet. But it's a thing. I, I dated a woman like that last paragraph I read. Massive creep factor. Yeah, it's massive creep factor. You've got to get out of those situations. But this situations. is not Patrick Bateman creep factor because this is not going to pan out. We are not supposed to hate this character. We are supposed to identify with this character as the reader. However, in fairness, from the same economic stratosphere. <laughs> um, another weird little thing here. Is it weird that I spend the weekends looking forward to class? Um, for mm -hmm. stupid people, yes. That's what you're supposed to be doing. You're spending fifty thousand dollars. You spend fifty thousand yeah. dollars to to go off and study. Yeah. Yeah. I know. Is it weird that I spent a wicked? No, you no. You spent money on this. Um, on one forty two, dad's uh, dad's good at being proud. He's good at providing, protecting, and playing games. But he's not good at being angry. It swallows him up. He goes into deep sleep mode, and someone else takes the helm. It sounds like he's very good at being mad. <laughs> <laughs> he's not good at angry. He's not good at being angry. He gets super violent. Sounds like he's real good at being angry. We're going to continue forward, though. We're going to give it a shot. We're going to finish it. And we'll be back next week. Uh, we will be back next week with part three of this. I still got so many things to I know on. you do. Adrian, do you have the chapters here, the page numbers? Uh, yes. We will be reading uh, 185 to 268, which are chapters 27 through 11. That makes sense. And if you like this kind of thing, make sure you hit the subscribe button down below. If this is your first experience with Strip Cover Lids, welcome aboard! Buckle we, up, this is gonna be fun. We post about books, short stories, or poetry every day, so hope to see you back. Absolutely so.